Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, uh, the Demography Today lecture series, uh, sponsored by the BBVA uh, Foundation in cooperation with the Lompop Horizon 2020 project. And we have uh, the pleasure to have today here Pau Wai Thang, uh, who is a ICREA research professor at Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. Uh, previously, he was research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research, lecturer at the University of Louvain, uh, where he received his PhD in demography and research associate at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he is the author of numerous uh, articles in social science journals and has uh, participated in several international research projects, uh, such as migration between Africa and Europe and policy responses to low fertility. Uh, currently, he is the uh, IP of uh, uh, different uh, projects on sociodemographic consequences of the Great Recession, altered class and gender relations, funded by the Spanish State Agency for Research. So thank you very much uh, for coming here to our lecture series. As usual, we have uh, around one hour lecture and then we open the floor for questions. So feel like a home. And much of this is work in progress, so your comments are very much welcome uh, because it can, can um, uh, enhance the, the, the product, the final product, hopefully that will be published soon. Um, here I focus on uh, uh, the interaction between, between international migration and family change, family processes. Uh, uh, I think well, much of the, of the research in these two areas has been uh, quite independent, so much of the people who work on, on, on international migration do not focus on, on, on family processes, and the other way around. Most, most of the people who work on, on um, family, uh, either f um, fertility of, or nuptiality, do not work on international migration. So these two areas of research have been kind of working parallel to some extent, and I think uh, looking together, these two processes can, uh, to some extent, uh, improve our, our understanding of each of them. So that will be the, the main rationale for, uh, for this, uh, uh, working on the interaction between these two processes. Here I will focus on, on one country, which is Senegal, which is an example of this type of interactions, and that for, for two reasons. I focus on Senegal for two reasons. The first reason is because it's, it's a good example, it's a good example of, uh, of these processes because it's a, a developing country with very different uh, demographic uh, profile than in, both in terms of uh, uh, migration and in terms of um, family, family formation than the countries of destination of these of this Senegalese mi migrants, which is European countries. So it makes a, a good contrast. And I, I think it's also a good example because uh, this is a field where it's not easy to make generalizations. Uh, one ha it is quite uh, context specific. It's very specific to each migration stream. And what we might learn in this, in this, in this lecture might not be applicable to another, to another, uh, to another uh, migration stream. And the second reason for focusing on Senegal is simply because I, uh, we have very good data, which is, comes from the project uh, MAFE, which stands for uh, Migration Between Africa and Europe. And, 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 and this is a very good data set, because an unusual data set, because it has information on both the origin country and the destination country. And this is very important, because then we can make the right comparisons, and we can see the, see the uh, approach, the, the, the each topic from both. The, 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 the perspective of the origin country and the perspective of the destination country. This is not usual. Usually, people either focus on, on, on one country or the other simply because of data uh, restrictions. So here, uh, uh, I can work in, on having both perspectives, the country of origin and the country of destination. And also, it's very good data. Later, I will talk about the data in more detail. But it's also very good data because uh, it provides uh, life, course, life course data on precisely these, uh, these two uh, processes, uh, international migration and family change. Um, so, in a way, what could be the motivation uh, for uh, studying uh, these interactions? In one hand, one can 
think that there is a direct effect of, uh, of migration on, uh, on family processes. For instance, you can have uh, a disruption of marriage process or a disruption of fertility process because of the separation of partners, for instance, or simply because people delay uh, uh, family formation. In fact, also, it can be a bit more indirect uh, effect because many social and economic processes that affect nuptiality and fertility are outcomes of migration. So migration lead to changes, for instance, in, in, the, in, uh, in cultural domain. For instance, it can lead in changes of values and attitudes and behaviors in family, both in the destination countries by migrants or migrants that go to the destination country might adopt the behaviors of the destination country, might be not in the first generation, might be in the second generation. Also, migration leads to changes uh, in the economic domain, in the general development of the, of the origin society, also in the destination society, but especially I will focus in the uh, origin society here, which is least, uh, uh, which is least, uh, has been least studied, but it changes very much the economics of the family, um, for instance, through remittances. Um, and also, uh, it leads to transformations, for instance, in the, in the family roles. So, so migrant families or, uh, change the, the, often their roles, for instance, in the case of uh, transnational, transnational, uh, transnational family arrangements. By transnational, I mean there is a growing literature on that and people use it in very different senses. But here, I, I essentially mean by transnational that um, uh, the family is kind of a split in different locations. So it's the same family unit, for instance, a, 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 a men and a women that are married or children that live in different locations, and that's uh, why they are uh, called transnational. But they still work as a family, even if they are in different locations, in terms of both social relationships, but also in terms of um, um, in, in their economic uh, exchanges. Uh, also, uh, family, family processes uh, have an impact on migration. Again, it can be quite direct, uh, this effect, um, for instance, in the case of marriage migration. But this very often has been a bit neglected in terms of uh, uh, migration theory, which has been focused essentially on economic motivations, in spite that, well, perhaps uh, a majority, or at least a, something like a half of the uh, migrations are seen to, uh, are recorded to be motivated by family, family motivations. But of course, this depends very much also on the, on uh, how this is recorded, how is this classified, how is it uh, the policies of the destination country, uh, and so on. So it's difficult to disentangle what is due to uh, family motivations with respect to more economic motivations. But it's clear that it's a, uh, at least in, in, in terms of the immigration to European countries and North America, might be a stand more, might something like a half of all migration. In spite of that, it's relatively less uh, studied. Also, uh, uh, family processes might, 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 might lead to migration, and this has been a bit more studied, for instance, uh, uh, um, family dynamics in terms of trying to change the, or to improve the, the economic uh, and, di uh, di and diversify the, family, the sources of income leads to migration. Also, some processes which are very much related to, uh, to family, like delayed marriage or uh, cross-national marriage, of course, but also low fertility, all this might lead to uh, changes in migration. For instance, uh, in, in some countries, it has been seen that the number of children, when it increases the number of children, the family needs more resources, so this might push some members of the family to migrate. So it's clear that there are uh, clear interactions, but in this, in, this, uh, in this lecture, I will focus, well, in the first part of the lecture, I will focus essentially on, on marriage uh, or nuptiality, and in the second part of the lecture, I will focus essentially on fertility. Uh, with respect to marriage, I have essentially two questions. One question is, does migration delay or accelerate or, or enhance uh, union formation? And this is a bit motivated, but in, 
again, in, in, for instance, in, in countries like uh, make, uh, migration from Mexico to the US, it has been seen that uh, uh, it is essentially mar uh, men migrating independently to to the US, uh, and these men usually delay marriage uh, until they come back. Um, but this is because in, in this context, by cultural reasons, uh, marriage needs, uh, co uh, normally means co-residence of the partners. But we will see that in the case of Senegal, this is not the case. So we will see what, what might happen in the case of, of Senegal. And the second question that they have is what are the, the determinants of cross-border marriages? Um, there are many different types of cross-border marriages. Um, and this, this issue has been studied in several, in several, in several uh, uh, contexts. Uh, for instance, um, the Turks and Pakistanis in Europe, in this case, uh, as in the case of Senegalese, are essentially men who migrate to Europe. Then they find there an imbalance in, in the marriage markets, so they look for the spouses in the, in the origin country. And this is a bit like uh, how it works for for in the case of uh, Senegalese, in the case of Senegalese, you have that uh, around 70% of, of uh, marriages by Senegalese in Europe are cross-border. So essentially, they look for partners in the origin country. There are other types of uh, cross-border marriages, uh, also in the case of Korea or in the case of Spain and many other countries, where are the locals who look for the spouses in the in, in other countries. But this is different uh, in the case of Senegalese, which is essentially a Muslim country with uh, strong uh, differentials between men and women. Uh, what you have is essentially uh, import of spouses. I don't like very much this import of spouses because it kind of downplays the, the agency of the, of the imported wife. So, but, but they do have their own motivations for choosing a, a migrant instead of a partner in the, in the origin country. So, but I think before continuing, I, I think I have to, to say a couple of things about uh, Senegalese family, otherwise we wouldn't understand much. And that's why I was saying at the beginning that this type of migration is quite context specific or at least uh, very specific both to the um, the situation of migration itself, but also to the uh, culture and the economy of the country of origin. So I would say a couple of words about the Senegalese family, uh, which is, a, I would say, in a very patriarchal society, which is strong gender differentials, uh, where it's more important the vertical relationships, so the elders are the ones with the most, most power. Uh, they organize an extended family where very often there are several family nuclei. For, for instance, when a, mo a woman marries to a man, usually she goes to live with the man in the, in the family of, of, of his family, with his family, with in-laws and so on. Of course, this changes because uh, in, in, in most uh, recent uh, times and also in urban context, this might not always be the case, but this is the, the traditional and to some extent uh, the preval the pre prevalent way of uh, forming families. And here I have especially the, the role of the extended family and lineage. Lineage relationships are very important in organizing both migration and marriage. So uh, we have this issue of uh, that uh, partners very often, even when they live in, in Senegal, do not live together. So it might be well, uh, very often the case that uh, the men and the women live in separate residences. This is important because it's, in this context, it's easy to, to, to arrange migration in such a way that the, also the partners live, uh, live uh, apart together, to, to use the, 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 the term that is used in Europe. So part, partners that live apart together, meaning that they form a family, they are a couple, they possibly have children, but they live in separate residences. And this is possible because of the weakness of the conjugal interaction in this type of families in, 
in most of the, the country or in most of the uh, groups in, in Senegal. So marriage is universal. This is frequent divorce, also frequent polygamy, which in this case means polygyny. Uh, about 35% of married women are in fact co-spouses. So if you are a woman, 35% you know, of them are in a relationship with another. It might be that, for instance, a man in Dakar, has, in the, the capital city of Senegal, has several uh, houses with several spouses, and he goes to visit, uh, let's say, Monday and Tuesday one uh, spouse, and let's say Thursday and Friday another spouse, and so on. Um, so this is possible. So there, there are people have, that have been doing this uh, um, qualitative research on these issues, and in fact, polygamy has not been decreasing, or very little decreasing, it has decreased very little in the last few decades. But what has changed uh, is the increase in, uh, in, in, in age at marriage. So we can have a look. This increase uh, in the case of women is essentially due to, or very much related to uh, 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 education prolongation. So increase in education. And in the case of men, is very much linked to the uh, deterioration of economic conditions, which was, were especially bad during the 1980s and during the 1990s. So later, in the, there's been some recovery, but basically, economically, this country has been stagnant during more, more than 20 years. So people had to find a way uh, to, um, to uh, both to, to for, for instance, in the case of, of men, they had to find, uh, I mean, they, they are the, the ones that are supposed, according to this, this marriage system, the ones to provide, are the, the, uh, the providers of the household. So they, they have to, in order to establish a household, they need to have the means to establish the, a household. So migration, for instance, might be, provide this, this means. And this situation of economic uh, deterioration during long period of time didn't help. So just to have a look at first union probabilities for men and for women, the first thing that you see is that huge age difference between men and women. So there is about 10 years in difference in age and marriage. So women marry in the early 20s, and men marry in the early 30s. So huge age difference. OK, this age difference is due for several reasons. One, as I was saying, because men has to um, save money and uh, being in a position to be able to, to, uh, to provide for the household, while women do not have such a pressure, although they usually work outside the household too. Uh, this is also important for, because uh, this is what makes possible, uh, this different, age difference between these partners is what makes possible polygamy. Polygamy is possible simply because you have a pyramid that is, it has a form of, of a pyramid. Otherwise, so you have, People at the age of 30 are fewer than women at the age of 20. Do you see? I, I don't know if I make myself explain, but this makes possible uh, precisely uh, polygamy or polygyny in this case. Of course, with a reduction of fertility, which we will see that there is been a reduction of fertility, it's not so easy to keep this, this situation. Also, a couple of uh, slides showing that uh, this is what I was uh, mentioning before, living apart together across borders. This is essentially Senegalese uh, men living in Europe and Senegalese women living in, uh, in married to these men in Europe, which live in, in Senegal. And you see when, once they separate because of the migration, they tend to live for many years separated. So, and this is favored preci precisely because this of system of marriage which we conjugal, uh, which conjugal uh, bond. So what is important is vertical relationship instead of horizontal relationships between partners. And this can be also seen here. I don't know if it's very well. For instance, transnational spouses, in the case of Senegal, you have that 36% uh, uh, are in, of migrants are in a transnational relationship. So meaning that one spouse, uh, the man usually, is, the, is in Europe, 
and the other spouse is in the origin country, in this case, Senegal. And this is compared to other flows. Uh, in the case of Senegal, uh, stand, stands by having a very high uh, proportion of uh, transnational uh, spouses. Also, a couple of words about migration. Uh, Senegal is one of the least developed countries in the world. Um, and normally, according to migration theory, this shouldn't be one, one, one country with very high levels or high rates of migration. But in spite of that, it is one. So since the 1980s, and very much coincident with this crisis, which is not a short time crisis, but it's a long, long term crisis, uh, the country became a, a, a country of emigration. And now you have that relatively high proportion of people, according to the census, so more than half of the people have uh, know somebody so abroad. So the migrant networks are very much extended in the country, and marriage rates have been increasing since the 1980s up, up, to, up to the moment of the recession in Europe. And France, Italy, and Spain are the main destination uh, in, this, in this flow. And here you have first migration probabilities. And well, the, the general shape of the, of the, of the, of the curve is, 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 is quite the standard. So essentially are young people, the ones who migrate. So the, the rates of migration, migration probability is uh, highest around the age of 30, both for men and women. But you see the big difference between men and women, so that means that few women migrate in general. But even among those who migrate, usually migrate in connection to family reunification. So they don't migrate independently, except a minority. So my first hypothesis, or my, our first hypothesis, is that migration increases partnership formation probability. So unlike the case of Mexico, that we, were, we saw that it delays marriage. Here, we think that it should in, uh, lower age of marriage, essentially because migration increases resources needed to marry. That's one thing. But also because once migrants are in Europe, they don't necessarily need to bring the, the spouse from Senegal, but they might uh, form these uh, uh, transnational uh, unions. By the way, also, uh, this affects uh, polygyny, so it has a positive effect on second marriages. So in this case, it will be a bit, uh, yeah. So a new behavior like migration, uh, uh, in fact, reinforces a traditional behavior like uh, polygamy. For women, uh, it's less clear whether this should happen so that, uh, um, but I think that there should be uh, some kind of indirective indirect effect through men's resources. So if men has uh, higher resources, this might indirectly affect the marriage uh, rates of women, although this might be a bit unclear. Also, no clear prediction for women migrating independently, which is a huge, uh, tiny minority of women. So it's not clear who these women are. Might be they are women with higher resources, might be they are students. So it's unclear whether they are going to be uh, so migration is willing to have a, a, a positive effect on marriage or not for these women. Um, and my second hypothesis is that most women migrate either simultaneously to marriage or as family reunifiers. This, of course, comes from knowledge of the, of the population, uh, but we will see uh, who is going to be uh, these women who prefer to marry uh, um, Senegalese men abroad. So there's little independent migration by women. We already see that because of the uh, low women status and resources and their main role of carers and household tasks. Also for men, it will be the other way around because they have to provide for the household. That's why they have to, 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 to look for resources even abroad. Women marry early and, and they provide these, these uh, long separations. So. My, uh, my, our third hypothesis will be male migrants in Europe are more likely to form a partnership with a woman living in Senegal if 
uh, in one hand, they live in a country with few single Senegalese women relative to men, so if the marriage market is unbalanced, so they imagine that most of these Senegal, uh, are Senegalese men uh, in Europe, these find themselves in uh, um, disadvantages in the, in, the, in the marriage market in Europe. So, uh, and, in, and, and in addition, there are few uh, Senegalese women there, so it's quite uh, rational, let's say, to go for women uh, to find a marriage partner in, Sen in Senegal. So why they don't marry with uh, other, uh, other groups in the, in the country of our destination? Basically because, and this is again a hypothesis, their socioeconomic position is very low. So there are disadvantages, disadvantages in, the in, the, in the marriage market simply because their resources are relatively low. Low with respect to the, the rest of the population in Europe because the youths, they, they, they are in the lower ranks of the as in terms of social status and in terms of uh, socioeconomic hierarchy, but they are in good position relative to uh, other men uh, in, in Senegal. Also, it's interesting to see uh, the role of the extended family. I, I was, previously, I was emphasizing the role of the uh, extended family. Here, I think that men's parent and family can also be interested in transnational marriages because it can increase remittances so imagine that the man marries a woman in Senegal. This woman goes to live in the, 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 the parental family of the man. So there is the, the remittances are going to flow to this uh, parental family. And also these women are going to provide uh, uh, work in the, in, the, in the parental family and maybe it might increase the return probabilities of the man. And why women? in the origin country should look for men in, in Europe instead of marrying in, in, in Senegal itself. Here, our hypothesis is that women with better social position and education will be more likely to marry Senegalese men abroad. And, and why? Because these men are relatively in a good position. They are not rich often, but in a better posi economic position on average than Senegalese men in, in Senegal. They have higher income. Um, also, we can look at this also from the point of view of the family of the women. For them, it might be a way to diversify risk and income. So by uh, um, having a link to a migrant in case of need, this might uh, be a, a possibility of um, having an income from essentially from remittances. But also, uh, marriage to a marriage with, to a migrant can provide the social capital uh, for other members of the family. So we know that something that is in all uh, in all research shows very clearly that having social capitals that the migrant networks abroad increases very much the the chances of, of migration. So if by marrying a migrant, the rest of the family can have a link. Uh, with a migrant, so they also increase the, their uh, probabilities of migration. A final hypothesis maybe, is that, that the likelihood of cross-border marriages increases if the woman has a migrant network in Europe, which seems quite plausible because in general we know that, uh, as I was saying, that my, uh, having social, uh, social um, uh, relations in Europe, migrant network, uh, increases the chances of, 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 of labor migration, but also, and this is uh, the, the, the hypothesis here, uh, increases the chances of marriage migration. Okay. Um, which data I'm going to use? I was saying that this, uh, this uh, survey, uh, well, in fact, it was a huge, uh, uh, large uh, project which involved uh, several, uh, several, um, um, several surveys. Uh, it included, in fact, surveys in the migration system of Senegal, from Senegal to France, Spain, and Italy, which here are the, the main destination of Senegalese, Senegalese abroad. Um, and also included other migration systems, but I'm going to focus on, on this one to, in order not to complicate too much things. So in the case of Senegal, uh, um, the survey was made in 2008, 
and was not large, but sufficient to provide uh, information on, um, on migrants and non-migrants. So it was done in the context of destination, France, Italy, and Spain, but also in the country of origin. And the very important characteristic is that it provided life course uh, data on partnership histories, on migration histories, on migration network that allows to know where is living the, the partner in case of, uh, in case of uh, marriage. And also provides fertility histories, activity histories, and so on. So it has very detailed information on, on migrant networks. And this is very important in order to know um, with whom and where is the, located the partner and uh, where are located the partners in, in case of transnational families. OK, um, I'm going to use discrete time event history analysis. My main dependent variables are going to be time to first partnership. And I'm also going to use, in some uh, analysis, time to first migration. I'm going to run a competing risk analysis. So for men in Europe, essentially their choice is either to marry a woman which is located in Europe or to a married woman which is located in Senegal. Why not women in Senegal, uh, in Europe? Simply because they are too few. And, and with, with uh, the sample was, was too small. So this is the standard, uh, uh, the standard situation. So men migrants in, in Europe that potentially might uh, either marry a woman in Europe, Senegalese or non-Senegalese, or marry a woman in Senegal, which is living in Senegal. And then for women in Senegal, so the question was, why these women in Senegal should marry a man in, in Europe? So here I make the competing race between uh, marrying a, a current migrant in Europe or marrying a non-migrant, so somebody who is living in, in, in Senegal. So my results. Uh, this is our odds ratio. So a number over one means that the probability is uh, higher. And woman under, uh, number under one, it will be meaning that the probability will be lower. For instance, for, for uh, here the variable is migration status. Uh, and for men and for women, I make separate analysis because the situation is potentially can be quite different. So the reference is reference categories, uh, non-migrants. So that's why it's one. But for men living in France, Italy, and Spain, their uh, odds ratio, so their probabilities of uh, marriage increase by almost 40% if they are located, if they are living in, in France, Italy, or Spain, with respect to men who are living in Senegal. So our hypothesis at the beginning was uh, migration to Europe is going to increase the marriage chances of, of men. Uh, but we didn't have uh, a clear prediction for women because we thought, oh, maybe they are students, maybe they are very special women in, in a country where few women migrate independently to Europe. Those who are in Europe might be very much selected. Well, for women, it's even higher. So the, so the odds of migration uh, of, of marriage increase by 60% if they are in Europe. But you need to know that also these women are in a very much uh, favorable position in the marriage market in Europe because they are three quarters of the population, at least in some countries, are men. Senegal is men, if we restrict the situation. to, So they are in a good uh, position. And also, it's int interesting to see that the departure year increases almost five times the probability of marriage. So that points to marriage migration. So that's why I'm going to make a, now my dependent variable is not, long, not going to be marriage, but what my dependent variable is first migration to Europe. And you see that uh, for women who marry, it doubles the probability uh, to migrate. So very often, unions uh, lead to, to migration. 
we can go a bit more in detail. Um, this is again my dependent variable is first migration to Europe. And for women, the union year, if the partner is in France, Italy, or Spain, the probability of, of, uh, of migration increases 12 times. And if the is, is, a, is a transnational marriage, so the, 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 the partners, uh, the, the man is in, is in Europe and the woman is in, in Senegal, the probability of migration increases almost 18 times. So you see that clearly women migrate essentially because of uh, family-related reasons, either the year of marriage, but also very often uh, after marriage. So women who are in the situation of living apart together across borders. Coming back to uh, the dependent variable first partnership, um, here we had the question is, in this case for women, who are the women who choose a man in, in, um, in Europe? In this case, in uh, France, Italy, or Spain, which are the main destination. You see that essentially are well-educated women, women with secondary education and tertiary education. This increases about three times their probability of marrying uh, a man uh, in Europe to so across uh, border marriage with respect to women with uh, low educated women. Also, ha the fact of having a network in Europe, apart from the, from the partner itself, so having a sibling or a cousin or a friend and so on in Europe, this increases very much the chances uh, of a partnership in Europe. So in the same way as having a network in Europe increases the chances of marriage in, uh, of migration in general, uh, it also in increases the chances of um, uh, uh, partnership. Also, if we go a bit more in detail into, uh, I was saying that were women relatively well-educated, but also these are women um, with a relatively good social position. You see that professional, professionals and employers have 18 times more probabilities than unskilled manual workers to marry a man in Europe. So it looks like this is a, a choice by women in Senegal. This is, the women with better social position and education are the ones who choose to marry uh, a migrant in Europe. Mm. Also students, by the way. And what about men? Who, who are the men who choose to uh, marry uh, a woman in Senegal? Instead of choosing a woman living in, in France, Italy, or Spain. Well, it's just the opposite to the case of women. It's essentially those who are more disadvantaged in the marriage market in Europe. Those with least education, the lower education, are the ones who choose uh, to, 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 to marry a woman in, in Senegal. So you see that those with tertiary education or secondary education have lower probabilities than those with uh, low education to marry uh, a woman in Senegal. Probably because these men have other uh, chances of marrying, might be um, outside their community, outside the Senegalese community. And what about the, the effect of the marriage market? So the unbalance between men and women. We know that in France, uh, the number of men and women are all, is almost uh, equal. So it's a balanced uh, marriage market um, among Senegalese. So that would be the reference. But in Italy and Spain, we know that something like between two thirds and three quarters of the, pop of, the, of the population are men. So this very unbalanced marriage market, and you see that precisely in these countries with very un unbalanced marriage market are the ones where men look for wives in the origin country which make, makes a lot of sense. In the case of activity, 
the sample size is very small and, and few results are, are significant. But one, one result that stands is that essentially the unemployed in general have little chances of marrying a woman in general. But uh, if they marry a woman, it will be more a woman in, in uh, France, Italy, or Spain. They have very little uh, chances of marrying a woman in, in, in the destination country. So some of them go to um, Senegal, Senegal. And this, again, goes in the direction of, OK, for women, it's a choice. So they marry and the, 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 the women with better uh, social situation. They, they, they look for partners in Europe. But for men in Europe are the ones with lead, uh, least chances of marrying in, in Europe are the ones who marry a woman, a woman in, in Senegal. So the conclusions for this section will be, uh, in one hand, migration boosts union formation for w both men and women, uh, not for returnees. And most migrant marriages are <coughs> transnational. And this is the, the idea of bright and poor, um, even if many uh, of these women stay behind because of uh, famine reunification, uh, very often do not take place. And transnational marriages are sold by men in Europe and women in Senegal. So both have complementary, let's say, complementary reasons for looking at this type of marriage. Essentially to improve socioeconomic situation, each one for their own reasons, to overcome disadvantages and imbalances in the marriage market uh, essentially in the destination countries. And also we can say that transnational marriage reinforce the links between migrants and their, uh, their families uh, in Senegal. But I want also to show uh, this research on uh, how international migration impacts fertility. Uh, there's been quite a lot of um, research on, on this topic in the destination countries, but very little on the impact on, uh, on fertility in the origin country. And that's why I wanted essentially to focus on that. But um, very quickly, Senegal is doing the, his, uh, its demographic transition. Uh, in the 1970s, had about seven children per woman. And now it's about five children per woman. So it's declining, in, especially in cities like Dakar. You have uh, around four children per woman. So it's declining this, uh, uh, in parallel with this migration. So. Maybe there is some, some relationship. Uh, I won't go in detail about these things because we don't have much time. Um, but simply to say that the sub-Saharan Africa um, transition is a bit special with respect to other transitions, uh, fertility, uh, demographic transitions. Uh, so it basically is based on uh, increasing birth, birth interval uh, irrespective of parity, which is a different model than uh, other uh, demographic transitions. So my hypothesis, to go a bit more directly, uh, in one hand, the more classical hypothesis uh, on the destination country. One is the timing, timing effects related to migration process, essentially disruption effects. Uh, so it will be low fertility around migration time simply because of the disruption, but this, then this could be uh, recovered. Then the, 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 the another usual hypothesis for, for this type of research, another usual hypothesis is adaptation to destination country economic situation. Mm, essentially, we think it's uh, uh, economic situation less to other cultural values because this is first generation migrants, so they have had little time to, to assimilate to the destination uh, culture. But at least they, they do have uh, different economic conditions because there are higher cost of children uh, in the destination countries. And also uh, a standard hypothesis is selectivity, but usually this uh, selectivity of migrants uh, is difficult to, 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 to test. But here we can do that because we do have information in the origin country and in the destination country. So we can, um, we can test the, the, the selectivity hypothesis. In addition to the selectivity of migrants, so we think that uh, migrants is a select group for reasons like higher risk proneness, social mobility aspirations, fertility preference, that, so they might have lower fertility preference. Of preference for a smaller family. Also, 
people with migrant networks might be selected. And you will see why I, I include this, this, uh, this remark. And then the hypothesis in the origin country. I think that people with uh, social networks abroad will have lower fertility. So that's relatively new hypothesis in the literature. Uh, one reason it, it, it might be because these migrant networks might convey um, new cultural norms, new cultural ideas about, um, about family size. Also behaviors, for instance, it can be um, contraceptive knowledge and, and so on. So all this, all this information conveyed by networks might influence people in the origin country. Also returnees might, might influence people in the origin country. But here I will focus essentially on, on, on social, people with social networks abroad, with social capital abroad. In this case, individuals with a, marriage, a migrant network abroad will show uh, lower fertility. That could be one reason, but another reason might be an economic reason. So, uh, so here the effect is a bit more in, indirect. People with networks abroad very often can receive uh, remittances, and these remittances increase the, the resources of the household, and this might lead to a change in, in the economics of the household. For instance, it might very often lead that uh, uh, children go more often to school, and this uh, might change uh, the whole uh, economics of, the, of, of reproduction, in a special it might change the, what is called the wealth flows. So this, the children cost more in one hand, and in the other hand, they uh, can work less. So they, they become more, co more costly. They're in, in, in economics parlance, they become, their quality becomes higher, so uh, parents tend to have few of them. Um, that, that can be one mechanism. And another mechanism um, so here the hypo hypothesis will be an increase in migration probabilities for the children has a, neg a negative effect on fertility. And here <laughs> it's a bit long to explain, but there is this, this uh, hypothesis which is called brain gain, which essentially means that the children of migrants uh, uh, in fact, go more often to school, and why they go more often to school, not only because of their remittance, so not only because they have more, more money, but because they might look for a, 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 um, a future migration to Europe. So remember that people with, uh, with uh, networks abroad have much higher probabilities of migration than the rest of the population. So also the children of these people are going to have more chances of migration. Since their future, as seen from their, from their parents' point of view, is going to Europe, so the parents very often uh, invest uh, in more in education. So higher perspective returns to skill in a foreign country, uh, rise the incentives for a skill acquisition at home. Also, more education provides more access to job, jobs in the developed country. And also the policies very often uh, favor uh, people with uh, high, uh, better education. So the parents uh, with networks abroad that think that their children might migrate in the future, so they tend to invest more in education. And that leads, leads to uh, lower fertility. So you see that this is a com <laughs> somewhat complicated or in indirect way uh, to ar arrive to the conclusion that high investment in education leads to a reduction of, uh, of uh, fertility because of uh, this perspective uh, migration. So if you have followed all that, you see that potentially there are many, many, um, many effects. And this is difficult. It is quite difficult to disentangle all these effects. For instance, for transnational couples, you might have that uh, you can have the, this effect of the, the reduction of fertility will a strong will will be a stronger and more groups with higher migration probabilities, that is, uh, people with um, migrant networks abroad. But this effect might be mixed with the separation effect. 
So if the couple is separated, uh, they, uh, normally they have lower chances of having a child. Also higher expectations for reunification. That again might lower the chances of having a child because if you have a large family you, and then go to Europe where children are more costly to, uh, then they, they might refrain from having a large family. Also the effect of remittances uh, and the, the effect of higher migration probability. So you see that there are, for transnational couples, all these effects are difficult to disentangle. We think that all these effects are playing and all of them go in the direction of lower infertility, but it's difficult to know which is the effect which is prevailing for transnational couples. What about individuals with kin networks abroad? Here we will have the effect of remittances that increase the resources in the household and also the effect of uh, higher migration probabilities induced by having a, a network abroad. And what about for individuals with non-kin networks abroad? I think the effect of remittances will be very low and then uh, I think we, we will see better this effect of higher migration probabilities because of having a, a, a network abroad. So even if it's difficult to disentangle, at least for different groups, we can, we can see different effects. Okay, the data, we know it. Um, is this uh, MAFE Senegal data. Um, here, the dependent variable essentially will be uh, fertility, so we have fertility histories, we have partnership histories. It's important to have also partnership histories because, of course, partnerships and fertility are very much interrelated. We also have migration histories and uh, migration network history. So this is very important because of the, of the hypothesis that I just uh, explained. Here is again discrete time event history analysis. Uh, it's time to a uh, first, second, well, up to 12 births. Uh, Senegalese families tend to be large families, so it can be until uh, 12 births. Um, since there might be selection effects going on, I include uh, a, a random term here, sorry, here, uh, specific to the women, so different births, spells, uh, um, there might be uh, selection into each of them, so that's why I include uh, this. And I further complicate things a bit with simultaneous equations, just to take into account the effect of, in one hand, fertility and partnership are interrelated, so one, one equation is for fertility, one equation is for marriage, uh, partnership formation, and the third equation can be either for mig migration, uh, because I was saying that migration is very selective, or with uh, having a network in Europe. So here will be yes, no. Do you have a network in Europe? Yes, no. Um, so what are the results? Well, this is for already for the correlation and heterogeneity terms. Here you see that... Uh, here I wanted to test whether migrants are a selected group. Uh, because if migrants are a selected group, when they, go to, when they go to Europe, imagine that these migrants are a low fertility group already when they were in, in Senegal, irrespective of their migration status. So even if they migrate or not, they are, for some reason that we don't know, a uh, low, low fertility group. If they go to Europe, they will be also a, a low fertility group. So here I, I, you see that there is a correlation between fertility and migration, you see that is negative, and this means that uh, clearly uh, people who migrate to Europe are negatively selected with respect to uh, fertility. So if we don't take that into account, we might overestimate the effect of fertility in the destination countries. So uh, if you just take the fertility as the, it is in the destination country without correcting for this correlation, you might overestimate the fertility, oh, sorry, uh, uh, underestimate the fertility in the destination country. So, for instance, this is, uh, this is the migration status. Here the dependent variable is uh, fertility. 
and this is uh, the reference group is people in Senegal. So people in Europe, for the migration year, you have this disruption effect. So clearly they have a half of the, uh, the, the, the probabilities of having a child are reduced by a half, which makes sense simply because of in the migration year, it's not a very good year to have a child. But what about later? So they might, potentially, you might say, okay, they, they recover their fertility. But in fact, what they have uh, is lower fertility. Uh, at least if you, uh, if you don't correct um, for selection. If you don't correct for selection, you, you, what you observe is lower fertility than uh, the non-migrants, so women in Senegal. So about, it's about 30% lower, the probability of having a child for women in Europe, even after five years. So here there are no disruption effects and so on. But in fact, this kind of underestimates fertility because once you take into account the selection effects with simultaneous equation, here uh, is no longer significant, these effects, this effect is still significant, the disruption effect, but it's clearly you are uh, underestimating fertility, and in fact, uh, uh, the effect of being a migrant in Europe is not so strong as it might be suggested uh, um, if you don't correct for, for selection. So it's important to correct for selection. That will be the message here. <laughs> Otherwise, you are underestimating, underestimating fertility. So the first conclusion will be, uh, fertility in the destination country, disruption effects of migration are present, there is a delay and then potential recovery. We see that there is no recovery because in fact, uh, but and, um, there's lower long-term fertility for migrants, but this is largely explained by selection effects. Once you take into account these uh, selection effects, uh, the fertility is not significantly different in the origin country and in the European countries. So this is an artifact of selection, if you like. Uh, mm. Okay, and what about, this was one part of the, of the issue, and what about the, um, the effects of, of, of having a network, of having social capital in Europe? Here uh, I have the heterogeneity terms of uh, um, having a network in Europe and also fertility and partnership formation, all, are, all of them are significant and also see that the correlations are significant. Um, the fact of having social capital in Europe, here I present with simultaneous equation and without simultaneous equation, the results are very, are somewhat different but essentially tell, tell the same thing. Uh, tell thing. What they tell is that if you have network in Europe, your fertility will be lower. But let's have a look for different groups. For instance, whether if you have a, a transnational couple, so the partner is in Europe and the women is in Senegal, her fertility is reduced by a half. You will say, of course, it's reduced by a half because we saw that there are many reasons that uh, lead to that uh, result. Uh, the fact of the separation, the fact of the remit remittances, and, 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 many, and, so, and so on. What about if these women, ha it's a woman, have relative networks, uh, a, a network of relatives in Europe? So here again, the fertility is reduced by about 15% with respect to other women who doesn't have uh, uh, um, relatives in Europe. And this is very likely to be, uh, here again, we have two effects. We have the effect of remittances and the, 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 the effect of the perspective migration for the children. And what about the uh, last situation? So it's a woman who has friends or acquaintances in Europe. In this case, the reduction of fertility is about uh, between a quarter and, and, and a third with respect to women who doesn't have this type of social capital in Europe. And here the conclusions will be, in one hand, transnational couples and women with networks abroad show much lower fertility, that would be general uh, conclusion, and this effect is strong and significant for non king networks. Uh, this cannot be explained by an increase in resources, so the issue of remittances, in the case of family networks, it will be probably, this effect, it will be very strong. 
Here, I think that a higher investment in education induced by a prospective migration is likely to be the key mechanism leading to a reduction in fertility. Thus, increased migration probabilities can reduce the fertility uh, for non-migrants. That will be the, the, the main results. And for a country like Senegal, which is in the, in the midst of the, the demographic transition, a high immigration level, which is the case in, the, uh, in, in Senegal, can potentially speed up the, the, the fertility transition. Because if you, a high proportion of the population has networks abroad, and we know that now about half of the population in Senegal have networks abroad, different kinds of networks. Uh, this, and these people with networks abroad have lower fertility. This can be an engine of the, of the demographic transition. Even in the future, when these children grow up, since they are better educated, they might also lead to lower fertility for themselves. So you see that now uh, having migration, high migration uh, probabilities and a high uh, proportion of population having neighbors abroad induce lower fertility, but also in the future because these children, which are better educated, will have lower fertility themselves. Okay, thank you very much. That's all.